Good morning. It's good to see you joining us by live stream. Won't you sing with us as we sing? Good morning and welcome. Thank you for joining us on live stream today. Today we are live stream only and uh, we're so glad that you're joining us there in your home. We hope that you sing. I want you to go ahead and, and grab your Bible. And as I'm saying a few remarks here at the beginning, go ahead and find uh, Deut or Exodus chapter 24 and John chapter 1. We're going to be having some readings from them before we sing some more. But the reason we're live streaming today and only live streaming today and this Wednesday in our midweek Bible study at 630 is because we've had a, a positive case of COVID in our congregation uh, with an individual who was here uh, last Sunday in our 830 service. And with his permission, 
uh, he has told me to tell you uh, to pray for him. This is Harold Cameron, and uh, we want to pray for Harold. We want to pray for Rita uh, as they discovered this news late afternoon yesterday. So thank you for your flexibility, and thank you for praying for them. And we want to lift them up in prayer and just saturate uh, heaven with our prayers for them during this time. Also, we have uh, some further sad news to share with you as a congregation today. Just learned this morning uh, that last night, uh, the passing of Elda Thorpe. Uh, Elda had been, um, of course, battling some health issues, and uh, she had had a recent procedure as well, and there were complications, and she passed away yesterday. So we want to remember Bill. Uh, we want to remember her children, her family, uh, as they um, are going through this uh, this week. So I'm going to ask you to join me where you are in prayer and let's at least lift these two families up to the Lord together. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. It's been a heavy last few hours, just news in our congregation, things that are going on. But Lord, we boldly declare that we trust you with all of this, God. But Lord, we lift up our friends to you. We lift up Harold and Rita to you, we ask that you would bless their home, that you would be gracious to them as Harold has tested positive, And we pray that you would protect him and Rita, protect their health, that you'd see them through this and preserve life. And Father, we just give that to you. We trust it into your hands because we know that you love them and whatever may come, Lord, you have purpose. And Father, we, we know that they are your children. And Lord, that you care for them. And we pray for Bill today and for Elda's family. We, we are grieved at the news of her home going, but Lord, we are encouraged that her suffering is over, that even the glory that we'll talk about today, she has now entered into that eternal rest, into that blessed hope, and we can rejoice in that. And we do. We thank you for a life that was faithful, a life that was full the life that was, was lived unto you. But we pray for her family, those who are grieving, those who are adjusting and will be adjusting to this loss. Lord, encourage, bring your peace, give your strength, give your courage for the days ahead. Be in our congregation. Be with all of your congregations that are faithful to you as we navigate these times, Lord, and and we have to be flexible and we have to learn, we have to grow, we have to be sensitive to your leading. So help us to do that. But as we do that together, help us always to be loving you and loving one another as you've called us to do. Thank you for the ability to be able to communicate together this way. For being able to turn on a television or a computer or hold a phone in our hands and be able to be connected in that way. So just take this time and the way we're doing it today, and just bless it and make it yours. Make it a time of worship. Make it a time of clear instruction in your word. And you speak to us, God. And you receive all of the glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to take your Bible now. We're going to read a couple of passages. One from the Old Testament and one from the New. And they both relate to what we're going to be reading about from Luke's Gospel a little bit later when we look at the transfiguration of Christ. When we read in Exodus chapter 24, beginning in verse 12, you'll see that when we get to the transfiguration, there are echoes of this scene from Exodus there. Exodus 24, verse 12 says, The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and wait there, that I may give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment which I have written for their instruction. So Moses rose with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up on the mountain of God. And he said to the elders, Wait here for us until we return to you, and behold, Aaron and her are with you. Whoever has a dispute, let him go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain, and the glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on top of the mountain in the sight of all the people of Israel. And Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Now turn to John chapter 1. And we read about the glory 
of Christ. Beginning in verse 14 through verse 17. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Master Darrell. Praise the Lord, His mercy. 
Till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes. To fulfill the law and prophets, to a virgin came the word. From a throne of endless glory, to a cradle in the dirt. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. To reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost. To redeem the whole creation, you did not despise the cross. For even in your suffering, you saw to the other side. Knowing this was our salvation, Jesus, for our sake you died. Luke chapter 9, there we are, Luke chapter 9, and we're going to be looking at a, a glimpse of, of glory today. I, you know, this is a great time for us to be encouraged by what we find here in Luke chapter 9 and getting a glimpse into the glory of Christ himself, um, but also the glory that awaits all of his followers. Now, there isn't a one of us that at some point along the way, maybe even right now, where we haven't had our expectations sort of dashed, uh, maybe our ex expectations for ourselves, 
Uh, maybe our expectations we've laid on another, they've all been unfulfilled. And, and one of the most frustrating things in life can be unfulfilled expectations because we build ourselves up for something we think we want or we, we think we have this idea of how things should turn out, but then it all comes crumbling down. It, it, it misses, and then we inevitably come crashing down as well and we're disappointed with whatever it may be that we have built up in our mind, in our heart, what we expected. Um, college football is back on, right? Yesterday, uh, Duke lost, Jeremy, and um, so did Kentucky. We both lost badly. But it reminded me, college football is back on. People enjoy college football. But I was thinking about dad's expectations, not just as a, a Kentucky fan, but that that's the reason that the punt was invented in football. When a team is, is trying to take the ball and they're, they're, they're driving down the field, the object is to get that ball into the other opponent's end zone. They get four tries to get 10 yards and sometimes they're on that fourth down and they still are you know, some ways to go and they have this decision to make, do we risk it or do we, we punt? And often a good coach knows when he should punt, because when you punt, you say, well, we didn't fulfill our expectations, but, we, but we're, gonna, we're gonna live to regroup and get a new plan and try again once we get, get the ball back. Sometimes, even in life, the strategy sometimes can best be played out when we know we need to, to punt and regroup and get a new plan and get back on track with God. The most important thing to remember when it's time to punt is that you don't quit, you don't become demoralized, you, you don't give up, you simply get the right new perspective that you need to have and you stay in the game. Now, why do I say that? Because what we're getting ready to get into is a, a moment of encouragement that Jesus gave to three disciples, Peter, James, and John, and we call this event the Transfiguration, and it's one of the most marveling um, most interesting, glorious moments that we get in the Gospels during the life of Jesus and his ministry, this thing we call the transfiguration. But when we put it into context, what we realize is it's helping these disciples to readjust their expectations. Because just before this, Jesus had been talking to them about his suffering, about the necessity that he would have to die, that he would be resurrected. But then he also told them that they were going to have to deny themselves, take up their own cross, and suffer and sacrifice with him. Now, when these disciples signed up to follow Jesus, they thought they were following Jesus to the throne of Israel. And he's just told them, no, you're going to follow me to the cross in a place of suffering and sacrifice. So you can only imagine how, how they were feeling at this moment, how they were processing all of these dashed expectations that they had had. And the transfiguration, when it's seen in that context, we see how these disciples were having to punt their expectations and regroup, but Jesus is gonna give them a point of encouragement even in all of that and give them some very important things to learn. Their bubble has sort of been burst, but he's going to give them hope and understanding about all of these things. Now, go to chapter 9, and let me back up one verse to verse 27, because the last time we were here, I didn't really explain this verse. Um, I kind of just moved right past it, so I want to back up and pick this verse up. In verse 27, after Jesus had spoken to the disciples about the cost of discipleship and Following him, he said in verse 27, But I tell you, truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Now, what that means in context is he's getting ready to take Peter and James and John up on this mountain, and he is going to reveal this glory that he just spoke of. So I believe most directly what Jesus is talking about in verse 27 is what is getting ready to take place here in the transfiguration. It's also very sensible that he's looking forward to the resurrection as well, and they would see the glory in that. But that's what Jesus is talking about. So that leads us into this section that we call the transfiguration. So read with me, beginning verse 
28. It says, Now about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter and John and James, and he went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. As he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this marvelous account and thank you for your word. Now help us as we consider it to see it clearly and encourage us today. Encourage us with the glory that Christ revealed and what it means to us. Lord, speak to us, speak to every person who's right at home now and listening. May we have an attitude of reverence, a prayerful attitude, an attentive attitude as we hear your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. What's a marvelous account. Luke tells us that about eight days after Jesus had spoken these very difficult things for the disciples to hear, that he was going to suffer, that he was going to die, that he would be resurrected, but also that they were going to have to take up their own cross and follow him. They were going to also be led down a road of great sacrifice and suffering. So they've been processing this for about a week And it says that Jesus took these three up on a mountain. We don't know where that mountain was. Many have speculated what mountain. It doesn't really matter. Jesus went away to pray as he often did. And he took these three, Peter, James, and John. Now, why did he take Peter, James, and John only at this point? Well, Luke doesn't tell us. There's never really in any of the Gospels a reason that Peter, James, and John became Jesus' inner circle. We could look to how they became key leaders later and maybe read back into that. But really, it's just simply because Jesus chose them. So he took these three and he took them up on the mountain and he took them there to pray. We often see Jesus going away, often up on a mountain to pray and to have communication with his heavenly father. They were one. And in good form, the disciples fall asleep. It says, Luke records that while Jesus was praying and all this was happening, they were were sleeping. And then Luke tells us that as they woke up, they saw something amazing. They saw Jesus, and Luke describes it this way, that his face had become altered, that his clothes became dazzling white, that something had transformed, something had transfigured about his His appearance also tells us that when they awoke, that they saw Jesus speaking with two other men. And somehow they discerned, because they told Luke later, later, who wrote this down, that they discerned through the conversation, this was Moses and this was Elijah. Now Luke lets us know that this was not a dream, because he clearly says that when they woke up. So you can imagine them waking up out of their sleep And seeing a glorified Jesus and a glorified Moses and a glorified Elijah all talking together. And now they're processing this. And Luke tells us that they were talking about how Jesus was going to accomplish his work. How he was going to be departing and it was going to happen at Jerusalem. When Luke uses the word departing, it's literally the word exodus. 
that Jesus was going to make his exodus and he was going to make it at Jerusalem. And this is the first time we've seen Jerusalem kind of come into the picture. Up to this point, Jesus has been, he's been working in Galilee with his disciples and that's been his region of ministry. But now there's a turn that's happening. Now Jesus is turning his face and setting it towards Jerusalem where his departure his exodus was going to happen. And it says that Moses and Elijah were talking to Jesus about what was to come. Can you imagine? That Moses and Elijah in their glorified state, Moses had been gone for some 1,500 years. Elijah had been taken up by God some 900 years. But here they were standing and talking with Jesus about what Jesus was about to accomplish in his mission. And Peter and James and John, they wake up. <laughs> and they witness this. Can you imagine? There's a couple of things that we learn. And you wonder, why did Jesus do this? And why did Jesus choose to reveal himself in this way at this particular time? And I think it's strategic. I think Jesus did this at this time with these three key leaders for a very particular purpose. And it was mainly to encourage them because of where they were and how Jesus was changing their expectations he wanted to encourage them. And I think it encourages us well today because whatever we're facing, whatever expectations have been dashed, whatever hurt we're going through, whatever suffering or sacrifice that we're in right now, the transfiguration serves the same purpose for us. It encourages us right where we are and it does it in a couple of specific ways. Here's the first one. The way the transfiguration encourages us is the transfiguration reveals what lies beyond suffering and sacrifice. It reveals what's going to come after that. Again, go back to verse 22 and see what Jesus had said. Remember, this was just about a week before he said these words. In verse 22, he said, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be, be raised. And if you just go on to verse 23, you see what Jesus then immediately said to his disciples. And he said to them all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Jesus had revealed to them the tremendous sacrifice, the tremendous hurt that was immediately before them on this road. That they were going to walk together to Jerusalem and it was going to be a place of sacrifice. It was going to be a place of of suffering. But at the transfiguration, Jesus gives these three whom have just heard this very hard thing, a glimpse of his glory. Because he wanted to remind them that although the road ahead has suffering and sacrifice in it, it's not the ultimate goal. It, it's just a stop along the way. It's part of the plan. It is necessary, but it's not ultimately where I'm taking you. I'm ultimately taking you into this glory that's represented by what you're seeing in front of you right now. Because here is a glimpse, here is a peek of who I really am. Who I really am. And I'm letting you in and I'm letting you see it. This time of sacrifice will be for a season, but this glory is going to be for an eternity. And that's something we need to hear as well. Because every day... Every week, every month, the road ahead is going to have its share of sacrifice, of suffering, of hardship, of difficulty. And some of that is going to come just because you live in this fallen world. But some of it is going to come because you're a follower of Christ. Christ is going to ask things of all of us who abide in him and who follow him. And none of that is ever soft peddled. That is very clear from Jesus' call to discipleship. But he gives us a glimpse beyond that. He lets us know and he encourages us by saying, but let me pull the curtain back a little bit and show you a real glimpse of my glory. And just what that did for Peter and James and John on that mountain on that day, it does the same thing for us. I'm reminded of what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8. He said, for I consider, in verse 18, he said, for I consider that the sufferings of this present age 
are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. The transfiguration brings us perspective. It helps us even in our pain, even in our sacrifice, even the things that Christ calls us to give up or he, he, he changes our expectations and moves us in a new direction. It encourages us that there is something of eternal glory and worth that is coming. The Bible also speaks of our blessed hope. In Titus chapter 2, I'm going to turn there and read that. In Titus chapter 2, we read about this. And it's so important because this gives us again that eternal perspective on the present things we may go through here. Paul was writing to Titus and in chapter 2 beginning of verse 11, he said this, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in his present age. Listen, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Scripture teaches us that yes, there is hardship in this world. Jesus said in this world, you have trouble. Jesus was changing the perspective of the disciples to say, don't expect this cushy kingdom that you've got in mind. I'm taking you down a road of hardship and suffering and sacrifice for his sake. But never forget that the ultimate end, there is this blessed hope, there is this glory that awaits Christ. He is coming in glory and power one of these days. And for everyone who abides in him, there is a future glory, a future rest, a future blessed hope. So everything that you go through now, every sacrifice that you think you're making, every hardship you think you're enduring, and yes, even in death, what Christ is saying in the transfiguration is that it's all worth it. Every bit of it, every heartache, every difficulty, every disappointment, every sacrifice, every moment of suffering is worth it if you're in Christ. Now, that's the first thing that we learn. There's a second important lesson that's just as important. And it's this, that the transfiguration reveals who has the preeminence, who has the preeminence. Peter's response uh, in the whole story is, is crucial to understanding this. And, and it's also crucial to understanding why Jesus transfigured himself because he's giving them hope, but he's also helping to reveal to them further his identity. Remember in the gospel, this is the, the storyline. This has been the big question. Who is Jesus? And Jesus has been slowly revealing himself to people, but particularly his disciples. And now particularly to these three Peter has already confessed, hey, we know you are the Christ. But now he's, Jesus is going to reveal something even, even more about his preeminence. In the story, you remember we just read it. Moses and Elijah appear. They're talking with Jesus. And Luke records that the disciples, Peter, James, and John, just must have been in awe, just listening and watching as this conversation took place. But the conversation wrapped up. And Luke says, as they were departing from Jesus, Moses and Elijah, that Peter finally said something. And it was as if Peter wanted to, to extend the moment. He didn't want this to come to an end. He, he wanted to stay there. So he says, and Luke says, he didn't know what he was saying. He was speaking ignorantly. But he said, Jesus let, let us build three tents or, or tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And the sense was, let's just stay here on this mountain for a while and enjoy this, this glory, this unbelievable glory that you've let us be privileged to. Now, when Peter said that, I think he had the best of intentions. I think what Peter was doing was he thought that he was elevating Jesus to the level of Moses and Elijah. I mean, this is Moses and Elijah. These are the heroes of their faith. And here they are in body right in front of them in this glorified state. And when Peter says this, what he's doing, he's saying, Jesus, 
you're on the same level with these guys. This is incredible. And let us build these three tents to you all. Let's stay here for a while. Now, the tents, you may think that's kind of strange, but it would have been going back to uh, observing the Feast of Booths, which when they observed the Feast of Booths in Israel, it was for a week. So what Peter was kind of slyly saying, hey, let's hang out here for about a week together on this mountain. And then Luke says, when Peter had said that, even before he was finished saying it, just like in Exodus, a cloud comes and it overshadows them, even engulfs them, and it darkens. Luke tells us they become very afraid, and rightfully so. And then a voice comes from the cloud. And it's the same voice that spoke at Jesus' baptism who said, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Now the voice comes of the heavenly father and says, this is my son, my chosen one, my elect one. Listen to him. Listen to him. And it was a stern rebuke because what Peter was saying was ignorant and it was presumptuous. He did not understand what he was saying. So Jesus is taking the moment to clearly help them understand his preeminence. They thought it was great that he could be on the same level as Moses and Elijah, but Jesus and the heavenly father is affirming, no, this is not the case. Jesus has the preeminence. Jesus stands alone. There is no other like him. It reminds me of the passage in Colossians. Go to Colossians chapter 1. And we have this beautiful passage from Paul about the preeminence of Christ. Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 15. Speaking of Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead, that in everything, listen, he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So what was happening in the transfiguration, as well as encouraging them and letting them know that this suffering won't last forever, there's glory to come. It was also revealing that Jesus stands alone. There is no one who stands beside him in power and authority. Jesus stands alone. He has the preeminence. And the disciples had to learn this. And it's something that we have to continue to learn as well. As we follow Christ, as you follow Christ, you call him your savior, him your Lord. We constantly have to renew ourselves to this truth that he has the preeminence in my life. And the number one person who competes for that is me. I'm the one who wants to control my life. I'm the one who sets it up with full of expectations for me and what I want for me and what I want for my family and what I want out of life. And I'm constantly having to bring myself back to the voice that spoke from the cloud and says, listen to him, not to me. There's so much distortion in this world when you're trying to make a decision about this or that or what you should do. And people say the most crazy things like, listen to your heart. One of the most dangerous things for me to listen to is my heart. Because scripture tells me how wicked my heart is, apart from the grace of God. The Heavenly Father said, listen to Jesus. Listen to him. Listen to his word. And get on the same page with him because he has the preeminence. Jesus' sacrifice is completely sufficient for all our sin. Jesus' love is sufficient to hold us until the very end through any difficulty. Jesus' promise of eternal life is is rock solid, sure. And Jesus' lordship 
is absolute and it demands all my surrender. During the transfiguration, when Peter said this very silly thing and the voice spoke from heaven to affirm God the Son, Jesus the Savior, the Messiah, the Lord, he said, this is the one and there is no other. And we have to remind ourselves that we cannot allow ourselves, any other person, any other thing to compete for our allegiance to Jesus. We listen to him. And if he has to make us punt our expectations, if he gives us a course correction, we need to listen to him and follow him. One of my favorite hymns, I think it's a powerful hymn, by Isaac Watts. It's called When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And it speaks beautifully to this point that we're talking about Christ's preeminence. Verse 1 says, When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Verse 2 says, Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast. Save through the death of Christ, my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. And then the last verse says this. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Jesus has the preeminence. Now today, I don't know where you are. I know these are strange times. Any expectations we had for 2020, I just they were thrown in the dumpster six months ago. And I know there are difficulties. I know right where you are, you're experiencing challenges and you may be frustrated at things. But let the transfiguration, as we talked about it, let it encourage you. I mean, if you just want to stick with that football analogy, maybe it's like in your life, it feels like it's fourth and 20 and you've already punted three times and it's just the first quarter and you're just discouraged. The question is, is are we going to trust Jesus with those kinds of moments? It's so easy to trust him when things are great, when plenty of money in the bank account and there's no COVID and everybody's healthy and the nation's not on edge. Oh, it's so easy to trust him then, but do we trust him now? Do we trust that there's a glory ahead that makes all of this tension and hardship and difficulty and death pale in comparison to the glory that's coming? And do we stay true to following him as our Lord and making sure that he has the preeminence and we don't allow fear or selfishness or anything else steer us in the wrong direction? It's a great test for the church these days. It's a great test for all of us to stand tall, to pray hard, to follow our Savior and our Lord, to declare his preeminence, to declare his glory, and to trust in it. Because God has all this. God's got all the big things. God's got all the small things. He's got your life. And if you're in Christ, he's got you too. And ultimately, he is going to keep you all the way to the end, to his glory. That's his promise. We're going to sing another song before we close our time together here. I'm going to ask Mackie and our singers, musicians to come on up. I believe we're going to sing Amazing Grace. And I hope right where you are, you'll sing this very familiar song with all your heart and to the Lord, knowing it truly is because of his grace and his grace alone that we have anything. Father, thank you for your word. Help us to be obedient to it. Help us, Father, to not despair, but to know without a shadow of a doubt the glory you already have and the glory that awaits us. And help us, even this week, as we go out in it and we have to negotiate various things, maybe some are pretty hard, most importantly, make sure that we follow you faithfully. Lord, we love you. We trust you with all these things. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thanks for being with us uh, during this time of worship. Just a couple of things uh, before we sign off here. Next Sunday, we, uh, we plan on being right back here in person, but we'll also still be live streaming our services at 8.30 and 11. But next Sunday is Lord's Supper Sunday. So we will have our individualized um, package communion elements that, we'll, that you'll have uh, for that. And uh, just let you know that uh, we're observing the Lord's Supper next Sunday. This Wednesday, again, we're not gathering in person, but at 6.30, we will be live streaming the midweek Bible study. Uh, we're in the book of 1 Timothy, so if you want to read ahead, uh, we're going to be going over chapter 3. Also, beginning next week, something very important, we've been getting the word out to you, but if you haven't heard, we're going to be entering into a time, a season of prayer in the life of our congregation beginning next Sunday, October the 4th. And going for 31 days right up to Election Day on November 3rd. We have this tool here called 31 Days of Prayer for My Nation. And we were, had these available for you to pick up today. But we don't actually start using them until next Sunday. So if you know you're going to be here next Sunday, you can pick one up. If you're going to be out of town or you're not going to be able to be here next Sunday, come by during the week and pick one up anytime. Our offices are still going to be open this week. Uh, so you can come by and you can get those. Or if we need to bring one to you because you're just not getting out, let us know. And we'll bring one to you because we want everybody in the church to be participating in this prayer emphasis. Also, next month, uh, all the four Sundays in October, we're going to be having Sunday evening prayer meetings at 530 here in the sanctuary in person. We will not be gathering in little small groups or getting close to each other. We'll still be observing our physical distancing and taking all those necessary precautions but it's going to be a wonderful time of emphasis on prayer, prayer for our nation, prayer for unity. We're going to be having times of guided prayer for many good, important things that we just need to be praying about. So I hope that you will plan to participate. Also, 
next Sunday in the afternoon at four o'clock, I'm gonna be doing our next uh, Discover Aberdeen First Baptist class. We'll be doing it via Zoom. So if you're newer to the church or you're our guest right now and you've been coming, you'd like to learn more about the church, uh, how we're organized, about our Baptist identity, our Southern Baptist identity, all of those things, be able to ask questions. We're gonna do that via Zoom at four o'clock next Sunday in the afternoon. All we need to know is that you want uh, to come via Zoom, we'll send you an invite. So you just let us know. You can email me you can call the church office, leave us your email, and that way we'll be able to, to contact you. Just wanna give a special shout out to Harold and Rita. We love you, we're praying for you. Um, if you get COVID, you get a special shout out, okay? I guess that's the rule, but um, we love you, we're praying for you, and, um, and uh, we just think the world of you. You're, you're a warrior, brother. And, um, and we're lifting you up to the Lord. And for, um, for Bill, your family, uh, we'll, we will let everybody know about arrangements coming this week uh, for Elda. Thank you for joining with us today. We hope that you've been blessed. Let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you. Thank you that even in all of the hurt of this world, disappointments and even death, Lord, you reign. Lord, you are glorious. Lord, you are working all things to good for your children. You are eventually working us all toward eternal life with you and glory. Lord, may that always give us perspective. Again, we lift up these families that we've mentioned today that have these special needs. Lord, bless them, give them grace, be with them in every way. And just let them know that they are loved by you and by us. Be with us this day and as we go into this week. Um, wherever you give us opportunity, may we be the light of Christ. May we be salt in our community, in our culture. Lord, may we walk faithfully with Jesus in every way. Lord, being pleasing to you. Thank you again for your grace, for your mercy that you give us each day in Christ. And we pray these things in his name. Amen.